want to start this morning by talking about a pastor probably you're unfamiliar with, a 19th century pastor from Glasgow by the name of George Matheson. He was, um, by all accounts, a precocious kid growing up. He was one of those kids that got all these awards as a teenager for like these papers that he wrote and that kind of thing. He graduated from college as a teenager. By the time he was 20, he already had his master's. He was you know, really bright. But apparently he was one of those obnoxiously bright people. He is known for his, he was known for his kind of boisterous personality, his, uh, his, his large laugh, his poetry that he would often write, and he was also known for something else, and that was his really thick glasses. He was not able to see very well, and actually, by the age of 20, he was diagnosed in such a way that it was apparent to him that he was about to go blind, that his eye would not get any better, they would only get worse. And it's not exactly clear all the details we have, but it seems around that time that he had been engaged, but that his fiance broke off the engagement, just concluding that it would be too hard to be married to someone who is blind. This was not enough to stop George. He, he moved forward, and, and with all of his gifts, he felt called into ministry, and by all accounts, was a very effective preacher and minister. And, and part of the reason he was able to do this was because for the course of 20 years at least, his older sister was his close companion who, who not only gave him fellowship but also helped him with just the natural needs that one has when they're blind. But there's this moment um, in his life when he is about 40 when his sister is, uh, has been engaged and it's the night before she is married. And you can imagine the mixture of feelings he must have been having on one hand joy for his sister, and yet on the other hand, grief, knowing that this close connection was going to have to change. And in that moment, he said, it took him surprisingly only five minutes, essentially, he wrote a poem, a hymn that we are familiar with today. We've sung it multiple times, O love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul on thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean's depths its flow may richer, fuller be. If you want to understand what we have been talking about the last few weeks as we've been looking at Romans 12, it's hard to do better than that, to encapsulate what we have been considering. We heard it again this morning. We've been focusing on especially this one instruction in Romans 12 that we are called, that we're invited to offer our bodies, offer ourselves to God. It's an image of consecration, of giving ourselves over to God. And it's one, perhaps, that when we hear the idea of giving ourselves away feels, feels threatening. And, and rightly so. If we give ourselves to anything in this world, we will lose ourselves but what we have considered the last few weeks is that uniquely with God, as we give ourselves to him, we find ourselves. Because he is not a black hole that just seeks to take and take and take. He is a God of grace who invites us to come to him so that he might have communion with us and we might have communion with him as he gives himself to us. And as we give ourselves to him and find out that he delights, he is the one who can be said of, oh, love that will not let me go. And as we give ourselves back to God, we find that in his enormous, massive ocean depths, the flow of our soul becomes richer and fuller. This is where the gospel takes us. As we come to understand the love that will not let us go, go, Paul says, therefore, give yourselves to God. So we have been considering the last few weeks the, what it is that Paul is saying here and, and, and why we are wanting to do this. But, but there's still kind of one more question, and that's the practical question. How? Practically speaking, what does it look like what does it mean for us to offer our bodies as a sacrifice? What is this call to worship meaning? What do you have in mind when you think of this idea of to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice? I have a friend who, um, who, who tells this story of when he was maybe 10, 15 years earlier, not necessarily a believer, although he was not hostile to Christianity, 
he was going through a really difficult time, and he remembers kind of walking outdoors just in the nighttime, trying to reflect on things, and at a certain point he was at a park, and he just fell to his knees, and he asked God for help, and he says in that moment he just felt infused with a kind of power that he had never experienced before, and in that moment he, he gave himself, he dedicated his life to Jesus. Is that what we should have in mind when we're hearing this instruction, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice? Or maybe we might think of certain moments in church or even when we were younger in youth group where songs kind of bring us kind of to this emotional crescendo and we feel filled with this passion and this longing and in that moment in our heart we say, Lord, I give myself to you. Is that, is that what we are hearing and what we should be doing with Romans 12? Is that what, we have, what God has in mind? And I want to say yes, but also no. Yes, there is something good. Sometimes God will bring us to these kind of mountaintop moments where we have been given a certain clarity and we realize that the best thing in the world to do is to give ourselves to him. But if that is what we have in our mind, it's too limited. That is only one small piece. In some ways, that is only the beginning of what Romans 12 has in mind. And it misses two really important things. Because if we understand Romans 12 rightly, we realize that it is less about responding to the power of our passion and more about depending on the grace of God. And it is less about some sort of decisive moment. And what is really being called for is an ongoing, deliberate lifestyle. And I'd like us to see both of those this morning as we consider these verses. We will be looking at 12 verses 1 and 2 once again, and we'll also be considering some things from Ephesians 4, because hopefully as you see, what Paul is talking about in that letter has a lot to do with what he's speaking of in Romans 12, 1 and 2. And, and what I want us just to kind of begin with is to pay attention to the logic that we have in those two verses of Romans. We have this first command, Romans 1, 12, 1, which we've been saying again and again, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And then in verse 2, you might see there's a second command. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is not Paul after verse 1 saying, okay, got it, living sacrifice, great. Let me move on to an entirely new idea. No, what he is saying is living sacrifice, that's a metaphor. You might have a hard time understanding what I mean, so let me kind of unpack. Here's what I mean when I'm talking about offering our bodies in this way. Here's what it looks like. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And what he's saying in this is that the life of offering ourselves to God is a life that involves the deliberate choices of entrusting ourselves to the grace of God of God. So first, in verse 2, we see a contrast between two influences. Perhaps you noticed it. It even kind of sounds like a wordplay. It's not a wordplay in Greek, but it still has two parallel ideas. On one hand, there's the idea of being conformed, which kind of almost says the idea of kind of being pulled back into a former way. That's one possible influence. And on the other, we say, on the other hand, don't be conformed, but be transformed, which is the idea of being moved into something new. There's these two different ideas. He says, do not be conformed to this world. And with this first half of the idea, there is clearly this idea of a clear break with a past that we need to make. This is developed a little bit more, if you noticed, when he talks in Ephesians 4. He's also having a similar idea of a break with the past. So, verse 17, he says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as you once did. And then later on, he will talk about putting off your old self. No longer living according to your former way. This is again and again this idea of what once was must no longer be. This is not when it comes to kind of like, Feedback, a praise sandwich. Are you familiar with that? Like, you know, if, you, if you're trying to, to help someone, the, the general, like, kind of accepted politeness is to start positive, 
and then slip in a couple negative things, and then be positive again. Like, you know, you've been doing a great job. Now, it would be great if you showed up not two hours late, but we appreciate your enthusiasm. Like, and somehow it makes it easier, right? That's not at all what Paul is doing. He's not saying, your life, pretty good, but he's saying, we need a break. It, it, it must be no longer. What once was must no longer be, and don't let it pull you back. And what is it that we are to make a clear break from? It's the life of godlessness. So when it says, do not be conformed to this world, literally it's to this age. And when Paul speaks about an age, he's really kind of speaking almost about the human project, the human project since Adam of seeking to live with God outside of the center where we are in control. When he says in Ephesians, when he talks about your old self, he's talking about the way we once were, where we were holding on to control, where we were seeking to be the one who navigated our own life, and we're trying to be self-sufficient. That is what he says. You need to break completely from this way of you doing things on your own. You must no longer be conformed to that way. Why? Because it was a complete dead end. Perhaps the best way to encapsulate the problem with this former way of life, which we considered when we were looking at Romans 1 with this idea of idolatry, is what Paul says in verse 18 of Ephesians 4. We were alienated from the life of God. That is not how humans are supposed to be. We, we, we are only able to be what we are to be when we are in communion with God, and when we, when we have been broken away from the one who made us, that does a number on us. It, it changes the very way we have of even being able to experience reality. In the subsequent verses, it talks about us becoming kind of deadened in our awareness. So skipping later, you might notice it talks about hardness of heart and, and callousness. In verse 19, you know, callous, if you ever like played playing the guitar, you might know if your fingers get calluses, they stop being able to feel things as much. And that's the idea that the heart kind of loses. We, we are no longer able to sense the things that we're supposed to be able to sense. It talks about here the mind being darkened in its understanding. With darkness, we are no longer able to see what we are meant to see. And if you move back a little bit further, it speaks of futility of our minds. The idea of, of purposelessness. That is that we, we have this sense that we are meant for something. And yet, being alienated from the life of God, we stop knowing what. And we just wander around aching, feeling like there should be something more, but not knowing how to get there. That's what happens when we're alienated from the life of God. I was reading one time a story of a person who was in the middle of nowhere and he got lost because his compass had stopped working. You know, if you know anything about a compass, you know the compass has one job, right? It's to point towards magnetic north. It's, it's a simple mechanism. If you have a magnet that's aligned the right way, it will sense where magnetic north is and point there. And as long as that works, you can find your way out of anything if you know what you're doing. But the tricky thing is, there is a way that if magnets get close to a compass, or even if your cell phone with some of its electrical waves can, it can start desensitizing the magnet so it no longer feels the pull of the magnetic north anymore. And if you don't know that, and if you're using that compass that has been desensitized, you can be moving around in circles, just following this thing, never figuring out why it isn't working. And what, what Paul says is that when we become alienated from the life of God, it's like we have lost any magnetic sensitivity to our true north, and we're just walking in circles, lost, not knowing why. And isn't that, a, isn't that how things feel right now in this time? That we're filled with a society that is moving around in circles with all sorts of energy, but not knowing where it's going because we have been alienated from the life of God, and our magnetic compass is completely not working. And Paul says, don't get pulled back into that. Why would you want to go into that dead-end way? Because something has happened to you to change all of that. 
And, and very simply put, he says in verse 20, here's what happens. You learned Christ. You learned Christ. He, he goes on to explain what he means. You've heard about Jesus. If you are a Christian at some point, you heard that Jesus is the Son of God who died for you. You heard about him, but, but more than just hearing about him, it says you were taught in him. That what happened is as you heard, as you believed, it got inside of you and you began developing this connection to Jesus, a relationship with him where it's not just about him, it's you know him. And, and more than that, he becomes your teacher and you become his apprentice. And he, he shows you the new way where there was darkness in your understanding, suddenly the light starts coming on. Where your heart was once just hard and calloused, you start being able to feel again. As, as you learn Jesus and the truth that is in him and you are connected to him, your, your soul becomes remagnetized and you start seeing again and knowing what you're called to. This is what Paul is talking about when he's talking about the renewal of our minds. It is a work of God. God, Paul says, is doing something to you. He has reached out and he has shown you Jesus and Jesus is leading you in a new life and by his grace he is showing you what it looks like to love him. And if we put this together, here's what this instruction in verse 2 is saying. Resist the way that was the former way where you sought to do everything on your own. Instead, allow the work of grace that is in your life to transform you. In other words, the worship that we are called to, the giving ourselves to God that we are called to, is about entrusting ourselves to his grace. I know of a pastor who spoke of, like, he said, for around 10 years with my congregation, I felt it to be my job every week to whip myself up and to whip the congregation up into a place of passion so that we could, with all of our emotion, just turn ourselves to God and say, God, I give myself to you. Do you know that feeling that sometimes we feel like to, to worship God rightly, we have to get ourselves to a certain place? Well, he came to have second thoughts about it. He says, I, I, I now realize I am weary, I'm tired, and I have come to see that the center is all wrong. We feed upon Christ, the bread of life, not our own subjective experience. Do you understand what he's saying? We, we have, I think, locked into our minds somewhere that there is a quid pro quo when it comes to worship. That, that God has done so much for us. He's given his son. He's forgiven us. He's given us eternal life. Now it's our turn. And what we need to do is give ourselves back to him. But there's a problem with that. Us doing something on our own is what got us into this mess in the first place. It's never about God does something and now we do something in response. God is the one himself who leads us to himself. His salvation is not just about giving us the ability to maybe do something right. His salvation is about changing us, leading us so that we might be those who give ourselves in God, to God in love. Every Sunday, we, we kind of are, are meant to recognize that because every Sunday it's God who calls us to worship and gathers us. Every morning, it is God who awakens us to himself and leads us to learn how to love him. The idea of offering ourselves to God is about learning to rely more and more on his grace as he leads us to him. Let me tell you, if you realize a simple truth, it will change everything about the way you relate to God. Jesus is your worship leader. You don't need to somehow figure it all out. Jesus is the one who takes you by the hand 
and leads you to God. It is all about depending on God's grace. And as we understand that it's about depending upon grace, there's God's grace, there is a second thing that we need to see in this passage. And that is this work of learning to entrust our lives into God's grace that is worship is about an ongoing, deliberate lifestyle. Let me just point out something that's obvious. When, when Paul says in verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, the very fact that he makes this his instruction shows that he understands and he believes that this is not going to just happen automatically. That there is every chance that if we are not paying attention to it, that it won't happen. That there needs to be a certain degree of choosing and intentionality for this to become true. Which, if you think about what he's calling us to, to not be conformed but to be transformed, the more that we think about it, the more that it becomes clear that, of course, it's going to take intentional choosing. Why don't you just think for a moment about all of the choices. There's probably thousands of choices you make in a given day. The choice to stand, down, sit, stand up or sit down. The choice to go for a walk, to not go for a walk. The choice when you're at a business meeting to talk or to be silent. The choice to in, later in the afternoon to decide to have a snack. We could go on. There are just choices after choices after choice. And my guess is that if you at the end of the day look at all the choices you made, there is not some major map with a plan for the day where you're looking at every single choice and you're like saying, 445, eat Triscuits. Like, that's, that's, not, that's that, not that level of intentionality, right? Most of the times we make choices, it, it's not even for any conscious reason. We, we make choices because of social cues, right? Like right now, you're not all talking because you're looking around realizing, oh yeah, it's not the time to talk. We, we are influenced by each other. We make a lot of our choices without even thinking because of habit. We don't choose, I'm going to brush my teeth right now. It's just something that we know we do because we've done that again and again and again. We make our choice because of just certain desires that we feel. I'm hungry. I'm going to have a snack. We don't think that much about it. Social cues and habits and desires, all of these have an enormous influence on us without us even thinking. And here's the challenge with that. Those three things are the very areas where we're most likely to be pulled into the way that we're trying to not be living. I mean, think about the instructions that we've considered. Do not be conformed to this age. That's about social cues. That's about when we look around and see the way that the society is. Do not continue in the, your former way. That's saying that there are habits that can be deeply ingrained in us that are not the way that we want to be, but the way that we once were. He speaks about deceitful desires, which means there are things that if we just follow what we want, we will find ourselves going directions that we do not want to go. So much of what shapes us threatens to pull us in the wrong direction. And so that demands a certain level of attention, doesn't it? To not be conformed to our former way it's not just enough to have some sort of decisive moment, Lord God, I change. I have died to my former way. If we think that's enough, we're naive. No, how do we, how do we move away from all of these subtle impulses that try to shape us? The only way I know of is ongoing, thoughtful attention. It, it's the kind of plotting small choices that we have been talking about over the last six months, thinking about the stories that we tell in our, in our minds, thinking about the different practices and habits, all of these seeming so small on their own, but, but again and again we need to make those choices if we want to not be just pulled subtly, subconsciously away from the way that we're called to be. And it's true when we're talking about the second half of this, not about not just being conformed, but being transformed as our mind is being renewed. Jesus is teaching us and he is training us. And how are we to allow that to happen? We, we pay attention. I mean, this is what we've been thinking about as we've been studying Romans and discipleship groups. How do we slow ourselves down 
and allow Jesus to speak to us? How, how do we allow our minds to be reshaped by him? It's about more than attention, right? Because it's, it's not just that our minds start kind of getting rewired, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind means that what our minds start understanding needs to start kind of spilling over into every aspect of our lives, which means it, means it, it involves resolve, right? It means making choices and, and thinking about how we're going to do things differently. And if, if you know yourself at all, you know that when you have certain patterns, changing those into something new, it takes attention. It takes effort. What this means is that this this offering ourselves to God, this worship that we are called to, is about deliberately choosing again and again to do certain things in certain ways until they begin to imprint our minds with a new memory, a new imagination, a new way of being. And the reality is that it means choosing to take on things that feel strange and unnatural and perhaps even constraining at first because we know that in them ultimately is found life and freedom. So when I was a youth pastor, which now seems like eons ago, I taught myself guitar so that we could kind of sing different songs in youth group. And I mean, you'll never see me up here. I'm, I'm no Nick Owens. But I was able to kind of like figure out a few chords and keep a beat. But one of the mistakes I man, ran into early on was, I don't know if you ever tried to play guitar, but your hand has to do like the weirdest things on the left to kind of get your fingers down everywhere. And there are sometimes I realized, you know, this fingering, even though I'm supposed to do it a different way, this will be easier. And it did. It made me start being able to play easier, but then I started running into some problems because I'd learned bad habits, and every time I made, tried to make chord changes, it just wouldn't work. So at some point, I had to go, okay, that was stupid. And I had to kind of retrain myself. And the problem was, early on, every time I tried doing this new thing that I knew was the right way, I had to slow down so much. And I had to like look at every finger just right, and then I could play the chord and go on. And then another time I'd play it, and I'd get it wrong, and I'd have to stop, and I'd have to move. It felt so awkward. But over time, after repeatedly doing things, it became natural, and I found myself being able to play with a lot more freedom than I did before. And I want to suggest to you that the Christ- we should expect the Christian life to feel very much like that. Because there is a way that is going to feel natural. That way is the way that we just see around us. It's the default. It's the way that we have deeply ingrained in us because it's patterns over years. It's the way that some of our desires want us to go. But what is natural is not what we want. And so what is going to happen is these deliberate choices where we're going to have to at certain times slow down and do what feels awkward and and just pay close attention to get it right. And then sometimes when we get it wrong, we're going to back up and say, okay, how did I do that? Let me try that again. Knowing that over time, as we begin practicing these things, as we begin taking on this new way of grace, it will slowly become a way of freedom and a way of joy. The, 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 the decision moment is not what we should have in our mind, but rather an ongoing, deliberate set of choices as we, as we seek to entrust ourselves to the grace of God. I keep on coming back to this, right? I keep on coming back to the image that I think at least some of us have stuck in our mind when we hear this call to worship, this call to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, where we have like this big mountaintop moment where lots of music is welling in the background and we have this like emotional outpouring. And I've been trying to say, while there is something there, it is the wrong image in our head. It misses, it misses the slow deliberateness and it misses the gracious element of the life that we're actually called to live. And so instead, I'd like to conclude by inviting us to think maybe in terms of a, of a different image. When we're thinking about what it means to offer our bodies 
to God, offering ourselves to God in worship. Perhaps it's better for us just to start imagining infants just beginning to learn to walk. Because we are, right? We, when it comes to spiritual, when it comes to knowing God, we are babies. Like, we are just beginning to kind of get up off our feet and, and, and like, wander around and, and, like, kind of tipsy as we're trying to figure out what it looks like to love God and to give ourselves to Him. And it's never really in a straight line. And sometimes the gravitational pull of our former way will just, like, plop us right down and then we'll try to get up. There's a, a ploddingness. But there's another aspect to this image that we need to have. Psalm 73 says to God, You hold me by my right hand. And as we are thinking about what we are called to, to offer ourselves to God, as these infants learning to walk, we must imagine ourselves the whole time being held by the hand of Jesus, our worship leader, who day after day, moment after moment, is with us, helping us as we're learning to walk, and when we plop down, picking us back up. That, that's the life of entrusting ourselves to grace that Paul is speaking about in Romans 12. It's a life of trusting the one who holds our hand and as he calls us to take the very next step as he's leading in the way of freedom. And as we begin to learn to walk, we also begin to learn to sing. O love that will not let me go, I rest my weary self on thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean's depths its flow may richer, fuller, 